Westing Studio One Summer Theater. Westinghouse, the name that means sureness. Whether it's on America's most popular clothes dryer or atomic submarines for our defense. Whether it's a product for your home, for your business, for your farm, or your factory, you can be sure if it's Westinghouse. Sorry, Mrs. Gordon, I thought I did. You surprised me, Barton. After working several years with the doctor, I should think the least you would have learned would be consideration of an invalid. I'm sorry. Poor Barton. You're always sorry about something, aren't you? Sorry for relaying appointments incorrectly, or for mixing up the doctor's appointments, or for making a wrong prescription. I have never mixed a wrong prescription. Please don't bark at me, Barton. I can hardly tolerate that. Oh, I realize you regard me with distaste. The good doctor's only mistake, being an aging invalid wife. However... I'm sorry, Mrs. Gordon. I have to bring down the rest of the luggage. That won't be necessary, Barton. I beg your pardon? Must I continually repeat myself, Barton? I said it won't be necessary to bring down the rest of the doctor's luggage. As a matter of fact, you may return that to his room. But he'll need them for his trip. You're being purposely thick-witted, Barton, in order to irritate me. The doctor isn't taking any trip. But he just told me. And I just told you otherwise. But, Mrs. Gordon, I don't understand. Really, Barton. I hardly find it necessary to discuss all the family secrets with you. But, Mrs. Gordon. Please, Barton, try not to be tiring and just return the doctor's luggage to his room. I'm sorry, Mrs. Gordon, but I take my orders from the doctor. Very touching, Barton, and most unwise. What my husband's motives were when he picked you up out of the gutter, I shall never understand. You're right, you never will. His only motive was kindness. Kindness to another human being, and that is something you will never understand. Kindness? You call it kindness for a man to expose his family to a common criminal? But that's what you are, Barton. You may have forgotten it. The doctor may have forgotten it, but I haven't. I suspect you haven't either, have you, Barton? You're nothing but a common criminal. Mother! Oh, here's Jennifer to speak up for you. Lucky Barton. So many defenders, so many friends. Bad day. Worse than that. She says his trip is off. Secret? What's this about Father's trip? Oh, how kind of Barton to tell you about it before I had a chance to. Father's trip? What about it? Darling, you don't have to act so grim about it. It's simply that I had to discharge that distasteful nurse. Why your father ever engaged you her? You discharged the nurse? When? This afternoon. Has she left? Yes, after being extremely abusive. You can't imagine some of the dreadful things she said to me. I probably can. But I don't see what connection this has with father's trip. Well, darling, I hate to remind you of it, but I am an invalid. And I require constant care and attention. It seems the only way I can get it is to pay for it. I'll engage another nurse, and that's the end of it. That's impossible. Absolutely impossible. Ever since Enid's left on her vacation, I've been tortured by sadistic, depraved nurses whom your father is engaged. There have only been two nurses, and they've both been highly competent. They may have seemed so to you, but they were horrible, horrible, and I won't have another one, I won't. Oh, calm yourself, Mother. I'll nurse you till Enid gets back. I realize what a sacrifice that would be, Jennifer, and I'm touched, deeply touched. But I'm afraid I must remind you again that I'm not a well woman. I need professional medical attention. I must have professional medical attention. Your father delights in treating everyone else in the world who has enough money to pay him for it, and since I have, Stop I don't believe he can do it. It won't work. It's neat. It's ingenious. But it won't work. Darling, I never understand you when you act so cold and brutal. Yes, you do, Mother. As a matter of fact, 
I'm afraid it's the only time you really do understand me. You've changed, Jennifer. Going away to college has changed you. Yes, it has. It's made you hate your own mother. I don't hate, but I know you. And you know I do. And I can see just what you're doing. For the first time in years, Father has a chance to get away for a few days. He's away from me. What a lovely vacation that'll be. He's not going on a vacation. He's going to a medical convention. Well, I can imagine what those conventions are like. Hundreds of men away from their wives, drinking... He's going to the convention to read a paper. A paper he's worked on for three years. It's important to him. Terribly important. He's been looking forward to it for weeks. I'm sure it's important to him, Jennifer, but after all, listen I Listen to me, Mother. And listen to me carefully. It's important to him. And it's important to me. Pay attention, Mother. Don't try to spoil it for him. Are you threatening me, Jennifer? In a way, yes. You do hate me. Not anymore. I did for several years. Then I learned that you're sick. Well, I shouldn't think it was necessary to go to college to find that out. Oh, but it was, Mother. Because you're sick mentally. That's mm. what's wrong with you. Now I see what you're up to. Clever Jennifer, you're trying to have me put away. Stop it, Mother. Where were you planning to spend my money? Paris, Rome, Antibes, laughing together about how you'd certified me insane? Stop this! Oh, were you planning to kill me? The third day outside. Chris and Paul. Definitely a day we should remember. Oh, Ralph, you startled me. Did I do? How long have you been standing outside the door? Father, I Darling, must talk to why you. why don't you take a stroll? I hate the thought of you missing one moment of this perfect afternoon. I'm not in the mood for a walk out. All I... right, then. Try composing Victorian limericks. Very pleasant way to pass the time. But don't cheat and slip into the bawdy ones. You were talking nonsense. So were you. And you did hear? Several things. Such as? You most considerately cancelled my trip. Darling, I'm much too tired to go through that entire thing again. It's just that I had to let the nurse go. Well, I hoped to persuade her to re stay until Enid's return, but she refused. Barton evidently was simply terrible to her. Was it? Well, she was much too upset to go into all the sordid details, but I assumed A that great deal, I'm sure. You're acting so strangely lately, Ralph. Well, I'm terribly sorry you had to give up your trip to the convention just to nurse me, but after all, Enid will be back soon, and... Ralph, what's the matter? I'm just gauging the difference between appearance and reality. Well, you really are being cryptic. But I'm glad you've agreed about the convention without any fuss. No, no. I haven't agreed to anything about the convention. That's negotiable. Negotiable? Yes. You want me to stay and I want to go. So we'll negotiate my journey. You mean you want something from me? You want me to give you something in exchange for your giving up the trip? Exactly. It sounds so cold-blooded. Doesn't it, though? Well, what are the rules of this negotiating game? That's the fascinating thing about it. There are no rules. No rules? None. Are the stakes high? Very. Very high. Well, what do you want me to give you? Money. What do you want it for? I want to buy something with it. What? Freedom. Ah, I knew it. I knew it. That's what you've always wanted. To get me out of the way so you could do what you please. Oh, no. Oh, no, no, dear. No, no. Not freedom for me. For Jennifer. Of course, I should have known it, the two of you. Oh, well, you've missed the point. If she goes, I can stay. Oh, no, you've missed the point, Ralph. Oh, how completely you've missed the point. All she cares about is being with you. If you stay, she'll never leave, never. She will and she must. There's nothing but death and decay in this house. I'm part of it, I know, but Jennifer isn't. She's young, she's alive, and I will not see her grow into someone like me. Yes, like you. I will not see it, and it's so easy to prevent. What does your money mean to you? Why, you've never even touched it. You've never bought anything with it. And what can you buy with it now? Nothing. But she can. She can. A year in Europe, a new life. Now, Elizabeth, please. Please, Elizabeth. She's all you care about, isn't she? You're Jennifer. You never think about me, do you? You don't care about your own wife. When you married me, you swore an oath. In sickness and in health. In sickness and in health, but you don't care. That is my money. You'll never get it, do you hear me? You'll never get don't it. Don't go too far, Elizabeth. Don't go too far. Oh, well, you'll kill me. I know you. You and your bargain will poison me, and then you and Jennifer and he will spend my money. I know you. I can see it in your face. That's what you're planning to do. Kill me. Mrs. Tobin, Mother. Why, in me, how nice. Me down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Delighted to see you, Emmy. I'm sure you'll stay for tea. 
Of course, when I say tea, I don't mean tea. You will have your sherry, and uh, Elizabeth will have her invalid port. And you will tell her all about the interesting things I'm sure you heard. <laughs> Ralph isn't in a very amiable mood today. He was planning a little holiday, and it's been cancelled. Has it, my dear? Well, how are you feeling, dear? Not very well, really, but I don't want to talk about it. Oh, you're a shining example to us all. Isn't she, Doctor? Definitely, Emmy. Oh, definitely. You know, my wife's strength and determination sometimes frightens me. Frightens you? Oh, I hope I haven't interrupted anything. Will you need me any more today, Doctor? No, I don't think so. Thank you, Barton. Thank you. Don't run away in that abrupt manner, Mr. Barton. Anyone would have if you were avoiding me. You know Mrs. Tobin. Yes, of course. How do you do, Mrs. Tobin? I was hoping for a word with you, young man. I believe the vicar is going to ask you to give us a lecture at the parish hall next month. Me? A lecture? What on earth about? Well, the vicar seems to think that the people of St. Saviour's would be fascinated to know how you dispensers make up your drugs. <laughs> Your poisons. Uh, clumsy of me. I hope I didn't scare anybody. Well, Ralph, how strange. You must be upset about something. It's probably my intense dislike to, to your invalid port showing through, my dear. Barton, would you mind clearing up this mess, dear? Of course. And perhaps someone will be good enough to go to the wine cellar and fetch me another bottle of port. I'll get it. No. I'll get it. The doctor doesn't seem quite himself today. She's been terribly difficult lately. He's been under a great strain, carrying on his regular practice and preparing his paper for the convention. She's so loyal. And absolutely right, of course. Perhaps. Too great a strain. Interesting that you should notice that, Emmy. Recently, he said some of the most dreadful things to me. I know, my dear. Frightening thing. It's true, Emmy. It's very true. Really, Mother, I don't think that all that kind yeah, of... Yeah, this will get it cleared up. Ah, Mr. Barton. Now, let me try to recall our conversation. What was I talking about, hmm? Vicar. Vicar, lecture, potion. Oh, I remember. Poison. Now, the vicar seems to think that it would be a most rewarding lecture and sort of lay the groundwork of a new sermon he's working on, Bounteousness and the Borgia family. Well, I'd be very honoured, very. But I'm sure I'll make a botch of it. I'm not much good at public speaking. Oh, none of our lecturers are. Oh, but don't let that worry you as long as you enunciate distinctly. Well, Ralph, whatever took you so long? Sorry, my dear. Oh, here, I'll decant the port for you, sir. Oh, thank you, Barton. Be extremely careful. You can trust me, Doctor. All the trouble I caused just for a glass of invalid port. You know, I think I'd like a glass of port, too. Good for you, Emmy. And you'll find it's not nearly so ghastly as Ralph pretends. I strongly <laughs> advise against it, Emmy. Oh, but I think it would be a nice change. I hardly think so, yeah. Have a good, honest glass of sherry. I have to count at the port, sir. Thank you, Barton. Thank you. Help yourself to what you wish. And you, Jennifer, my dear. There you are, Elizabeth. Aren't you joining us? I hardly think this is an occasion for celebration. Oh, it tastes very bitter. Your imagination, my dear. I think you'll be able to get away from this house in the very near future. Why do you say that, Father? Because I'm a prophet. I'll tell you a secret. When you think I'm out on cases, I'm really sitting in a little back room off Piccadilly with a towel around my head gazing profoundly into a crystal ball. Emmy. 
Barton, send for the coroner. It was so sudden. So terribly sudden. It was the best way, my dear. She felt no pain. What could it have been? Her heart, dear. Her heart. Versus Dr. Ralph Gordon, charged with administering a lethal dose of arsenic to his wife Elizabeth. You were Mrs. Gordon's nurse for how long? Six years. On the basis of your six years' experience, how would you describe the relationship between Dr. Gordon and his wife? Dame, would you say the Gordons were a happy couple? Mrs. Gordon was a very difficult woman. Witness will confine her answer to the question. I repeat, would you say the Gordons were a happy couple? No. They quarreled? Occasionally. Would you be so good as to answer the question? Yes, they quarreled. I object. Overruled. Miss Wayne, would you say that Dr. Gordon was successful financially? Fairly so. Only fairly so. He treated a great many patients who couldn't afford to pay him. Highly commendable, I'm sure. Is it not true that Mrs. Gordon had a substantial fortune which went to her husband upon her death? Dr. Gordon did not murder his wife. He was too good and fine a man to do that. Witness will confine her answer to the question. Miss Wayne, is it not true that you were in Scotland a week previous and three days following the death of Mrs. Gordon. Yes, that's true. Then I'm sure you'll admit you're hardly in a position to testify as to the events preceding the murder. Big part. Summarize for the court the testimony of Miss Wayne. She has reluctantly admitted that Dr. Gordon was not wealthy, that his wife was that they fought bitterly on many occasions, many, many occasions, that Doc, Mrs. Gordon feared her husband on many occasions, a rich wife who feared her poor husband. Therefore, the one thing you are certain about is that Dr. Gordon did know there was arsenic in the dispensary. Yes. Now, will you tell the court exactly what happened after the bottle of port was dropped? Well, the the doctor asked me to get a rag to clean up the mess and then went to the cellar to get another bottle of port. And where did you get the rag? In the kitchen. And when you returned, everyone else was in the room except the doctor? Yes, sir. Now, would you be so good as to tell the court the location of the dispensary? At the head of the cellar stairs. Right at the head of the stairs, which led to the wine cellar. Think to yourselves how easy it would be, how supremely simple an operation it must have been for the doctor to take the bottle of port from the wine cellar, walk to the head of the stairs, slip into the dispensary, pocket the arsenic, and re-enter the drawing room. Could anything be easier to do? Couldn't you or I or anyone else? Are ah, they gotten inside the house? and sat down and engaged Mr. Barton in conversation regarding a lecture that I wish him to give, when Dr. Gordon dropped the port. Can you recall the precise word you said, the instant the good doctor dropped the port? Yes, I can. It was poison. When you said a word, one word, the good doctor dropped and smashed a bottle of port. Yes. The word, of course, was poison. Did anyone else except Mrs. Gordon ask for port? Yes, I did. And what did the good doctor say to you when you made this reasonable request? He said, I strongly advise you against it. And did he then give you a glass of port? No, he did not. He gave me a glass of sherry. And for a very good reason. Because the port was poison. May I ask the court? I remember distinctly what I heard Mrs. Gordon say when I entered the hall. She said, 
You want to kill me. Then you'll spend my money. That's what you're planning to do. You'll kill me. And what has the defense said? Beware of circumstantial evidence. That's all they could say, ladies and gentlemen, because they do not have a shred of evidence on their side. They have tried to make this case complex. They could not because it was too, too simple. Terrible as the facts are, they are simple. The doctor poisoned a bottle of port. Put some of it on. The court interrupts the summation of the court. My lord, I protest this is most unusual. The court is well aware of the unusualness and necessity of this move. Will Miss Jennifer Gordon take the stand? Will you state exactly what you did before your mother died? I poured a glass of the invalid port and drank it. Therefore, inasmuch as the Crown's case was obviously invalid, and inaccurate in the light of this evidence, and at fault in not presenting this evidence in the course of its prosecution, the court must direct the jury to bring in a verdict of not guilty. <laughs> See our friends have left their visiting cards. Found innocent. No, it is. I wasn't found innocent. I was found not guilty. And there's more than a semantic separation between those two words. I'll get a fire going and have the house straightened up. Oh, don't bother. Tell me, tell me one thing, Enid. What do you think really happened? Did she kill herself? She was much too fond of life. I know. I've thought and thought. And I'm the only person who could have the ghost of a motive for money. One could say she was an exceptionally trying woman to live with. Well, no. <laughs> no, my dear, you don't go about murdering people because they're trying to live with. If you did, you'd soon find yourself in a much smaller world. You feel terribly bitter. Bitter? No, I'm not bitter. I'm used to facing facts and drawing the conclusions. And the facts are very simple. My patients believe I'm guilty. They not only told me to, but they've told me to Get out of town. After all you've done for Oh, my dear, that's human nature. And the ones that owe the most money are the most venomous. What are you going to do? I'm going to follow their advice. I don't understand. I'm going to get out of town. You're going to run away? Exactly. I'm going to change my name, buy a sanitarium in Ireland, and, of course, if you and Barton wish to come, I'd be very happy, but if you... Of course we'll come. Let's drink to that. But won't your running away look to everyone as if you were... Guilty? Oh, yes, possibly. Yes. But as my patients think I'm guilty anyway, it's no concern of mine. No, Enid, there are only three people that I like and interested in at all. That's you, Barton, and, of course, Jennifer. You understand me. The rest, well, I'm afraid we'll just have to forget. New environment, new work. Why? In a few years, it'll all be behind us. Let's drink. And now, Enid, would you make four reservations for four immigrants for Ireland? Of course. Yes, 
Grandpa. Oh, my dear. Me. Where have you been? I've been so worried about you. Walking. Oh, my child, you look exhausted. I'll get you some brandy. People kept staring at me. Everywhere I went, they'd stare at me and then start whispering things. Oh, my darling. I know you've been through an awful ordeal, but it's all over. It's all behind us now. Is it? Yes. We're going to leave here immediately. You're, you're running away. Oh, don't put it like that, my dear. We're going on a trip together. To no. Ireland. No. All right. Well, not to Ireland then. To, to France, to Italy. You I... don't understand. I'm not going with you. Anywhere. Ever. You think I'm guilty? What else can I think? But I'm not. Father, don't look at me like that. But you, of all people who know me better than anybody else in the world, and you think I did it? I know you must have done it for me, because you loved me. Just as I loved you. But that only makes it more horrible. Can't you see how I feel? I expected more from you. More from you? More from me? What more can I give? I've perjured myself for you, isn't that enough? I stood in the witness box and lied for you. You never drank that port? Of course not. But I, I couldn't let them hang you. I see. I'm going now. Well? I don't know. Will you write me? No. Jennifer! 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 Did you call me? Dr. Gordon? Dr. Gordon? Are you all right? What? Are you all right? Yes. Why do you ask? I thought I heard you call and now you seem so. I did. It's about the reservations. Yes. There will only be three of us. Now that you've seen part one of The Man Who Was Acquitted, we turn to our Westinghouse program and Betty Furness. Welcome back from vacation, Betty. Thank you. And hello again. I had a wonderful vacation in California. I always do. But it is good to be back home again on Studio One Summer Theater. I guess I kind of needed a vacation after those political conventions. I do want to thank everyone who wrote expressing their thanks for the fine way in which Westinghouse and CBS brought the conventions into their homes. I can assure you it was a great privilege for me to be associated with such an important event. I wonder if by any chance you read in Time magazine that during the conventions, I opened the door of a Westinghouse refrigerator 52 times. And here I am again, opening the door of the world's finest refrigerator, the Westinghouse Frost Free. It never needs defrosting. In fact, you never have to do anything at all. Even the defrost water evaporates automatically. Let me show you how you can identify a genuine frost free. You see that? Well, that's the magic button that's the sign of the frost free system that's exclusive with Westinghouse. Now, you never touch that button. It counts door openings automatically. You see, every time you open the door, warm, moist air rushes in and causes frost to form. Now, when you've opened and closed the door enough times for frost to begin to form on the freezer, this button automatically gives a signal that starts the frost-free system working. And every trace of frost disappears so fast that the frozen foods here in the freezer always stay firmly frozen. Isn't that wonderful? And don't forget that you can trade in your old refrigerator on a new Westinghouse frost-free. And with the easy terms on appliances today, you can have this great refrigerator in your kitchen for as little as just a few cents a day. And what's more, there's a size for every kitchen and a price for every purse. 
So own the finest fully automatic refrigerator made. Remember, you can be sure if it's Westinghouse. We return now to Westinghouse Studio One Summer Theater and the man they acquitted. of my second year in Ireland. And may you have hundreds more of them, Dr. Harding. Thank you, Sean. I need hardly say they've been two of my happiest years, and the sanitarium's a success. I've been working with two very old friends here, and met many new ones. But I'm sure you all agree the real reason for my happiness is my dear wife. I drink to you, darling. Thank you. Well, now let me continue with my story. The murdering medical of County Mayo, he was called. And when the police finally burst in upon him, they found him whistling Mother McCree whilst dismembering a victim. And the number of tibia and fibia scattered about the cellar struck wonder into their hearts. Now, the Dublin doctor of death was a completely different type of man. Much neater. Enough, Mr. O'Quirk. <laughs> You're forcing me to defend my husband's profession. <laughs> now, Mrs. Harding, I never said all doctors were murderers. It's just that the ones that are, I've always found fascinating. Well, here's <laughs> to a doctor. One that I've always found fascinating. My husband. Thank you, Ron. And I'll join that toast with alacrity to Dr. Harding, who not only founded a sanitarium in Ireland sod, but found a lovely colleen among the cabbages. <laughs> <laughs> you certainly know how to roll a phrase, Mr. O'Quirk. Uh, thank you, my dear. That's due as much to my Celtic temperament as my legal training. Oh, oh Dr. Harding. Yes, John. Did you ever hear of a Dr. Gordon? How many thousands did he dispose of in, in dark, mysterious ways? Oh, just his wife. I thought Dr. Harding might know him. He came from around London. Well, sure, a lot of doctors come from around London, you know. Oh, but you must have heard of this one. It was in all the papers two or three years ago. Not too long before you came here. What, uh, what made you think of him? Well, I ran into a clipping from a paper the other day about his daughter getting married. And it said no one had seen hide nor hair of him after he was acquitted. Oh, was he acquitted? You, you never heard of the Gordon case? It was fascinating. Fascinating. Oh, will you please It all began me? with... There are several things I have to go over with Dr. Harding. Thank you. Yeah. He slipped his wife some arsenic in her invalid port. I remember saying at the time, serves her right for drinking such eye wash. He would read that clipping. Oh, now, Enid, don't, don't be upset. Whoever would connect the two? Whoever would think that the happy, successful Dr. Harding was really Dr. Gordon? I'm not sure that I do. You are happy, aren't you? Tremendously. You aren't frightened that the newspapers will track you down and fill oh. their headlines with lies about you? Don't be melodramatic. Why, all they say is Gordon, Gordon, that's the chap who polished off his wife. Wonder whatever happened to him. I hope you're right. Well, you know I'm right. I'm always right. You should know that. You never told Corinne, did you? No, I didn't. Are you sure that was wise? No, I'm not sure. Either. I don't think you two cards are going to leave me alone with the, the unstoppable O'Quirk. He's <laughs> your attorney, and if, you, if I have to listen to him, you have to listen to him, too. <laughs> did I make too hasty a retreat? Mm, it was much too flimsy an excuse. Oh, no. You better go out and give Barton some moral support. He's turning the most fascinating shade of green. I'll go. Corinne, there's something I really must talk to you about. I know. You're an opium smuggler. I've always suspected as much. No, but seriously. Do you remember the last time you said that? It was just before you proposed. You looked at me sternly and said, seriously, you must consider the considerable difference in our ages. And knowing what was coming next, I sat there looking at my toes, pretending to consider the considerable difference in our ages. But I wasn't. No, but really, there is something I, I must talk to you about. I know. You married me for my money, and I consider it very bad taste of you to bring it up. There's nothing I can do about it, because I'm hopelessly in love with you. Mm. Colleen, 
Not if it's serious. All right. live here. He does. Do you have an appointment? Yeah? But then I don't think I'll be needing one. The doctor's a very man. Is he now? That makes two of us. I'm afraid you'll have to write for an appointment. Mr. Heffernan of the Dublin Evening Star. Oh. Well, if you'll wait here a moment, I'll, I'll see if the doctor can see you. Yes, you do that little thing. Yeah. Quite a parched layout. Indeed. Good morning. Are you waiting to see the doctor? Mrs. Harden, is it? Yes, that's right. Michael Heffernan, ma'am. Feature correspondent to the Dublin Evening Star. Oh, is it something about the clinic? Oh, no, ma'am. It's nothing about the clinic. Uh, we thought uh, you'd uh, like to give us a statement about your stepdaughter's wedding. And I haven't got a stepdaughter. Oh, come now, ma'am. I, I know at your age you wouldn't want to be owning the daughters, but uh, you can't expect to keep a thing like this from a man of the press. Well, I do hate to disappoint a man of the press, but I haven't a stepdaughter to my name. From your husband's earlier marriage. I'm afraid you have the wrong, Dr. Harding. Oh, no, ma'am, I don't have the wrong. Doctor. Just let me have a look at the notes. Why, why, Mrs. Harding, you, you couldn't be more correct. It was a, a, a Dr. Ballister who had a stepdaughter, and I was to see Dr. Harding about the clinic. Yes, indeed, I was. Thank you very much for putting me on the right track. Well, you're welcome, of course. Mr. Heffernan? Oh, it's a pleasure, Doctor. I, I wonder if there's a, a place we could have a little chat. Yes, of course. Well, Mr. Heffernan, what can I do for you? It's a very good question, Doctor. A very good question indeed. I don't think I quite understand. I originally came here to get some info on your daughter's marriage. So? You've tracked me down. Nice piece of work, if I do say so myself. If a doctor changed his name, I figured, he'd have to go to the medical society and tell them or they wouldn't give a license. Sure, I had a little chat with a little secretary at the society. All right, so you've got your story. I know you're sort of the press. You don't care what you destroy, a home, a marriage. A fine practice. I sympathize with you, doctor, I really do. You can spare your sarcasm. I know how you must feel about newspaper men. They've given you a terrible time. And most of them are just what you said. No doubt about it. Journalism can be a degrading profession. I know. I had to stoop to it myself to, to earn my bed and board. But at heart, I'm a poet. Ah, there's no nobler life than to have nothing to do all day but write poesy to gladden the heart of the world. I don't want to be rude, Mr. Mr. Heffernan. Heffernan, but I'm sure your editor is breathlessly waiting your return. Oh, it's interesting you brought that up, Doctor, because... Uh, the editor doesn't know a thing about this. You might call this uh, a sort of a freelance job. I got the hunch when I uh, saw that article about your daughter. Your hunch turned up, eh? Well, not so as you'd notice it, Doctor. Uh, that is, uh, not yet it hasn't paid off. Do I make myself clear, Doctor? I'm not sure that you do. Well, if I was to write that article about you, Doctor, and it was published, it would ruin you. You'd lose your practice, your sanitarium, Everything. And what would I gain? A pittance. Not to mention the terrible sense of guilt I'd have for engineering your destruction, when all I want to do is to write poetry. Now, what I propose is... Blackmail! Let's say I want to give you an opportunity to become a patron of the arts. What do you say, Dad? Get out of here before I break your neck! What kind of an attitude is that? Get out! Do you think I'm full enough to be bled by a leech like you? Oh, no, get out! All right, Mr. High and Mighty. Why don't you tell your wife the truth? Tell her about your daughter. Tell her how you poisoned your wife, Dr. Gordon. But you better tell her fast, or she'll read it in the papers first. What did he mean? It's true. I am the Dr. Gordon who was acquitted of poisoning his wife. Why didn't you tell me? Oh, I tried to. I tried to even the other evening, but I just couldn't. 
You always seem so young and happy. I you think I couldn't rise to it. Can you? Well, of course I can, but, but I must hear about it from you. Well, it's easy to say. My wife took a lethal dose of arsenic. Whether it was suicide, accident, or murder, we were never able to find out. But they accused you. How could they? They didn't know me as well as, as, well as you do, my dear. I'm not sure how, how well I do know you. I thought you loved me. Well, you know I love No, you. When, you, when you love someone, you, you share things. Not, not just the good things, the bad things, too. You shouldn't have shut me out. I wanted to protect you from what I've been through. It must have been terrible for you. Living with a secret like that, not, not sharing it with anyone. Enid knew? Barton knew? Everyone but me. Please try to understand. I, I am trying. I'm trying desperately. Why did you change your name? I thought I could start a new life. Silly old man, eh? Why did you have to? Weren't you acquitted? By the judge, yes, but not by public opinion. My patients turned against me. They, they wrote threatening letters. Murder is such a serious thing to accuse anyone of. They must have thought you had some motive, some, some overwhelming motive. Yes, they found too. First, that I hated my wife, and secondly, that I, I wanted her money. Oh. What became of her money? She left it. Half to Jennifer and half to me. Then we're living on it right now. We're living on what I earn. But you used the money to yes, buy her Yes, yes, to buy the clinic, yes. Well, I can't understand you're accepting that money after what well, happened. Why shouldn't I, darling? I was innocent. Was she fond of her mother? They never got on very well, no. But then she had just as much motive as you. Just as much and just as little. It's more and more fantastic. Why haven't I met Jennifer? Why hasn't she been here to visit us? Does she know about us? No. I don't understand. Did you quarrel? But weren't you fond of each other? I adored her. She adored me once. Sean O'Kirk said her testimony saved you. Isn't that true? She lied for me. She lied? She lied in the witness box? The case against you as black as that? The very near thing. She heard herself for you. She must have loved you very much. Why hasn't she visited us? Because she thinks that I did it! Your own daughter thought you were guilty. Yes! I could hardly believe it myself, but it's true. Right after the trial, she stood in front of me, and she said she didn't believe me. And when she said it, she had a strange look in her eye. The same look that you have now. And now let's turn again to our Westinghouse program. Emergency exit. Say, she certainly looks as if she's in a hurry. She is. It's just started to rain, and she wants to get her wash off the line before it really pours. Uh-oh. The storm beat her to it. Isn't that a shame? It's too bad she doesn't have this wonderfully convenient clothes dryer in her house. Because then, let it thunder, let it rain. It just doesn't make any difference, because with the Westinghouse clothes dryer, the sunshine is right inside it. Your clothes are tumbled in warm, clean air, as gentle as a breeze on a lovely June day. Say, did you ever get a backache from lugging heavy baskets of clothes or, or bending and stretching to hang them on the line? Well, this Westinghouse clothes dryer is the best cure that I've ever seen for that backache because it's so very easy to use. Let me show you how you do it. You just take your washed clothes and slip them right into the Westinghouse dryer. Then all you do is set the dial and start it, and that's all. For things that you want to iron, you set the dial at just the degree of dampness that you prefer. Or set it at dry, and your clothes come out completely dry, ready for storage. Fluffy, soft, and sweet-smelling. Just look at this cotton rug, for instance. Why, that nap is just like new. Pat, could we have a close-up of this so they can get a really good look at it? Now, there. And that's the way your Westinghouse dryer turns out everything. You know, I find that many women who own a Westinghouse clothes dryer do all of their washing on rainy days. And then when the sun's out, instead of hanging up clothes, they go outside and really enjoy the nice weather. With the Westinghouse clothes dryer and its famous twin, the laundromat, in your house, you have the most completely automatic home laundry that you can own today. No wonder they're America's favorite twins. See them at your dealer. And remember, you can be sure if it's Westinghouse.
return now to Westinghouse Studio One Summer Theater and the man they acquitted. Ah, uh, it all seems to be in order. Yeah. We'll need a witness. I'll ring for the maid. Do you think I've left them enough? I think you've been more than generous. They've been particularly loyal to me, you know. I'd appreciate it very much if you could find them employment, really. I'll do my best. Thank you. How much do you think the place will fetch? Between seven and eight thousand. No more than that? You see, it's no longer a going concern. How right you are. Six weeks ago, we had 33 patients and a staff of 11. Now we're down to Barton and Enid, and the last patient left a week ago. Oh, oh Cassie. We want you to witness a signature to the doctor's will. His will? Sure, and you're not thinking of dying, are you, doctor? <laughs> Stop blathering, girl. Come and put your name to it after his. There. <laughs> <laughs> Who taught you to write, Cassie? Father O'Day at home in Femoy. He was an optimist. <laughs> That's the ticket, Cassie. Run along. <laughs> Well, I'm off, I suppose. Well, have you made up your mind where you're going? Oh, America, somewhere. Well, if I'm looking after your affairs, you will keep me posted, won't you? Power of attorney's a funny thing, you know. You mean it ends at death? That's what I mean. If I die, you'll know about it soon enough. Newspapers will tell you, don't worry. Well, I'll be getting on my way. Goodbye, Sean. I'm much obliged to you. If we don't meet again, goodbye. That sounds pretty final, my boy. Let's make it or of war, shall we? Uh, I'm not coming back to Ireland. I've made my mind up. Well, whatever you've made your mind up to, sleep on it. Give me Costello's garage, please. Hello. I want a car to take me to the harbor. Yes, I'm catching the night, night boat to Hollyhead. Fine, yes, about 9.30, be here. I, I, only a small car, I have very little baggage. Thank you. Dublin 28701, please. Hello. I want to book a single cabin on the night boat to Hollyhead, please. No, I must have a single, single cabin. The name? Uh, Smith. Martin Smith. Good. Good, I'll, I'll be there about 10.30. Thank you. Teetotaler makes a rotten drunkard, doesn't he? Hello, dear. Enjoy your walk? Mm. What have you been doing? Oh, just writing. You look awfully tired. I'm all right. You sleeping better? Oh, yes, on and off. You should let me give you a stimulant, you know. Pick me up. It certainly helps. Ask Barton. Has he been drinking again? Well, I suppose it's his way of taking lonely walks by the sea. Isn't it very odd that he should take to drink again directly this thing came up? Oh, my dear, now you don't suspect Paul Barton. I suspect everyone. Including me. Oh, instinctively, I, I know you couldn't have done it. That's the side of me that has nothing to do with reason or logic or, or facts. But you see, I can think two opposites at the same time. It's my other side that doubts. The side that asks... Why, if he was innocent, didn't he tell me from the start? Why did his own daughter think he was guilty? Why, in that, in that horrible dossier he gave me to read, do all the facts point one way to him? So that's what you've been thinking when you've been pacing your floor at night? You hear me? 
You must be awake, too. What are you thinking about? I expect I've been wishing that we could still be together. Darling, if you're going to your mother's, you better start driving, you know. You'll miss the last of the light. Yes. I suppose I had. I'm all packed. Connie, tell me one thing. You've always been happy at your mother's, haven't you? I had a very happy childhood there. Yeah. I just like to think of you being surrounded by happy things. I should be thinking of the happy things that were here. I'll get the car. Drive carefully. I'm not going. You must. I can't leave you like this. Goodbye. I am serious. Ed, we've been through a lot together. You shared most of my confidences in the last eight years. And now I'm presenting you with the final one. Fine. Yes, it's this. I'm going away for good. What? I'm clearing out. There's no use you arguing with me. You've just got to face the facts. But this is dreadful. You can't go. You can't. I'm sorry. No words will alter my decision. I see. Where are you going? I'm afraid that's my business. Now, Enid, I want you to do something. I want you to post this letter for Corrine after I've gone. What was that I saw you slip into your pocket when you left the dispensary? Nothing. Was that little green bottle empty? I suppose it wasn't. Then I'm right. Yes. You can't. You can't. Suicide's not a solution. It's an evasion. Think of Corinne. It may blast her whole life if she knows what she's done. Edith, get it out of your head. No words will stop me. Oh, yes, they will. Do you remember what a methodical woman the first Mrs. Gordon was? Methodical? Right. Yes. For instance, in regard to her invalid port wine, she always drank two glasses every day. She never varied it. That meant opening a fresh bottle every seventh day. Did it? When I went off on my holiday, there was half a decanter on the sideboard. You were due to go to the cancer convention nine days later. Therefore, you would decant the next bottle Three days after my departure, but the bottle after that would have had to be decanted by somebody else. I suppose so, yes. On the night you were to have gone to the convention, you overturned the decanter and you spilled the wine. I did. So you decanted the bottle someone else should have decanted. Well. Before I left, I put arsenic in that bottle. Why, Edith? Why? I worshipped you. I hated the way Elizabeth was spoiling your life. You were in misery and I couldn't bear it. I hated anything that stood in the way of your happiness. Whether I had any part of that happiness didn't matter. Ralph. I'm going to tell the police now. But before I do, I want you to believe one thing. If you'd been convicted, I would have confessed. Acquitted, I wasn't separated from you. You were broken. You needed me. You don't need me anymore. Betty Furness to say, don't start the day with a start. 
That's right. Nobody likes to wake up like this. <laughs> it's bound to give anybody a start. Don't you agree? Why, that poor fellow. He could wake in so much more comfortably every morning if he had one of these wonderful new Westinghouse clock radios. You just set the proper control, and the first sound you hear every day is the soothing strains of your favorite music. It'll even sing you to sleep if you like. Just set the sleep control right here, and it shuts off automatically when you go to sleep. Now, here's something else that's really special. See that? That's a connection to start your morning coffee perking or turn your Westinghouse electric sheet or blanket on or off. Isn't that handy? Now, this Westinghouse clock radio comes in this handsome maroon cabinet that you see here, and it also comes in an attractive ivory cabinet. But whichever cabinet you prefer, you can be sure that you'll always get perfect reception for any radio program that you want to listen to. Like the new Pick the Winner series, for instance, on CBS Radio every Sunday afternoon. It's a fascinating election debate, and it's brought to you by Westinghouse. Now, this smart clock radio costs only $39.95, and you'll be amazed at its clarity and power. And it's an absolutely dependable clock. See it at your Westinghouse dealers tomorrow. And remember, you can be sure if it's Westinghouse. Take the winner. Westinghouse will bring you this exciting political program Sunday afternoon on the CBS Radio Network and Thursday nights on CBS TV. See and hear prominent speakers from both parties as they debate the issues. Don't miss Pick the Winner, brought to you by Westinghouse. This is Wheels Closed by Larry Holdridge.